the writer Douglas Adams uh, wrote a book called The Meaning of Lif, which some of you may possibly be familiar with. He took funny place names from around the world and particularly the very strange ones that we have around the UK. And he sought to use them to define things for which we have no word in the English language. And I want to give you three of them which relate a little bit to today. So the first one was the Ely, the first tiniest inkling you get that something somewhere has gone terribly wrong. Followed by the Wembley, which is the hideous moment of confirmation that the disaster presaged in the Ely has actually struck. And then finally, there's the Godalming, which is the wonderful rush of relief on discovering that the Ely and the Wembley were in fact false alarms. I love that uh, expression, the, the, the use of Godalming to express that sense of relief. There is that wonderful feeling that you get when something, a pressure is lifted off you. Romans 8 is a bit like that, we'll get to it, not because there's a false alarm, but because of that sense of pressure being lifted off. Just to put one more uh, picture on it, I visited some friends in West Africa about three years ago, and uh, we were out there to, to support them. Uh, they were in a closed nation, or are in a closed nation still, and very isolated, and it was, it was a chance for us to get alongside and support them. And while we were out there, uh, they decided to butcher a ram uh, to celebrate us arriving and I helped to butcher it and I'm not quite sure what happened but at some point during the butchering uh, I managed to pick up something that didn't do my stomach any good and it started with uh, about 24 hours later just the beginnings of a queasy feeling and at that point uh, very wisely they said there's the guest block over there <laughs> you've got it all to yourself uh, there's a toilet, there's a mosquito net, you know, come back when you're feeling a bit better. And I then spent the best part of 24 hours honestly wishing that I was not alive. There was, there was uh, very, very few times that I've wished that in my life. Um, but yeah, having to get out from under the mosquito net and go and do whatever needed to be done and then return for half an hour of half sleep and then and so on. And all that time knowing that I was supposed to be there supporting them. <laughs> the people out there it got worse and worse and worse and then it got to the stage and you'll be familiar with this because you'll have been ill as well it got to the stage where you suddenly think this is not as bad as it was anymore i almost feel like i could eat something and you, you feel very fragile but there's hope this might be this might be coming to an end and then there's that day that you wake up and you go I'm just really hungry and really washed out, but I'm better. And it's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? And you never realize quite how good it is just to be healthy until you've just come out of a period of being unhealthy. So I want you to hold that in your mind, that feeling of relief, at having been horribly sick or having had something go horribly wrong and suddenly it's no longer wrong. And then imagine that along with that, you wake up and it's your birthday. It's the, it's the best day of the year and you're feeling well. That is the feeling with which Romans 8 hits us because we have spent seven chapters having, you know, Paul does not pull his punches. He lays out the dire status of every human being on the planet and he shows us that we're all guilty. And then he introduces hope in chapter five. He talks about peace with God and, and chapter six, a new creation. But just as things seem to be looking up, he shows that even as new creations, no system of laws is going to save us. And he, he ends, almost ends, chapter seven with these words, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then we have Romans 8. So this is not a three-point sermon. This is not um, three things that begin with the same letter or anything. What I'm going to do is just lay out what Romans 8 says about life in the spirit, as opposed to the other way that we can live, life in the flesh under law. And all the way through Romans 8, this is the, the dichotomy that we have. We have Paul saying that there's one way to live. You can live to satisfy the flesh. You can live under law. Or there's another way to live, life by the Spirit. So, life in the flesh. We have guilt now. We all live with a measure of guilt, probably, even though we know we shouldn't. But everybody lives with a measure of guilt because even by our own standards we don't live up to our own standards let alone if we have some sense of standards beyond that uh, the law of the land or a, a moral law 
or, uh, you know, adherence to religious belief. Everybody has guilt because we don't even live up to our own standards. But then on top of that, those who fear the Lord have a fear of judgment to come. It's really interesting. We've just been going through the, the minor prophets, the, the book of the 12, as the Jews call it, um, with our kids. And there's a number of books in which the prophets say, you're hoping for the, the day of the Lord because you think that's going to be a day when everything will all be put right for you. You don't understand. It's going to be a really hard day because God is going to judge you. And these people are in fear of what's to come. If we live in the flesh, we feel guilt now and we have a fear of judgment to come. And Romans 8 says, no, life in the spirit, there is now no condemnation, not just in the future, not just at some future point when you'll be justified, but now, in your life now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit that gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Right now, we get to live a life with no condemnation and no guilt. I remember my life before I was a believer in Christ. I became a believer aged 14 and I was your classic angsty teenager and I was full of guilt at all the stuff that I was getting wrong. I, was, I got into really messy relationships. I'm not just talking about um, amorous relationships, like my friendships were messy. I got into, you know, I, I told a silly lie and then stuck with it and it expanded and, and suddenly I, I had to keep up appearances of things that weren't true and and I, you know, I offended people stupidly and, and all kinds of other stuff. I, I, my life was a mess and I was feeling guilty. And one of the things that most marked coming to Christ was suddenly realizing that his word over me mattered more than anything else. And his word over me was not guilty, not condemned. This is the truth that we live in now. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that an amazing truth? He goes on to say then that through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit that gives life set us free from the law of sin and death. What is that law of sin and death? Well, it is our trajectory as human beings towards death. Like it or not, every single one of us is on a trajectory towards death. And in Genesis 5, which is you know, right very back at the beginning of the Bible, we see that after Adam and Eve's sin, we have this genealogy of all the people who came after them. And each one, it gives us sort of when they were born, and their their marriage and their kids and how long they lived and then they died and then they died and then they died and it's like the writer of genesis is just hammering this home since we set ourselves up as an alternative authority on good and evil to god which is the original sin of adam and eve in the garden since that moment every human being has been on a trajectory towards death and our focus has been on preserving our physical life. And you see this come out again and again, you know, even in the Old Testament. Save me, Lord, from evil men. There's this kind of cry in our hearts of like, God, just, just keep me alive. Even today, one of the few things that people will willingly undergo pain for is to extend their physical life. And sometimes it gets to the stage where it's almost as though, and, and some people I know have taken decisions uh, when op options of chemotherapy and radiotherapy have laid ahead of them, where they've said, actually, what that will do to my quality of life is not worth the trade-off for living longer. But some of the things that people will do to extend their life by a few more months are incredible because we have this trajectory towards death and we resist it. That is life in the flesh. Life in the spirit is a trajectory to ever-increasing life. We see this in the New Testament where there's no fear of death. You see Paul say, look, I'd, I'd rather be with Christ but, you know, I'll, I'll stay alive a bit longer because I want to be with you guys first. That, that totally runs against the spirit of the age and the human condition, doesn't it? To, but he is so overflowing with the life of God that it doesn't matter when his physical body dies. He, he is on a trajectory towards life. Instead of this focus on save me and keep me alive, God. Jesus says this. He says, this is John 7. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He promises this time when the spirit will be so poured out on us that we overflow with life and bring it to others. Instead of save me, Lord, from evil men, perhaps the word over, over our New Testament life in the spirit is I am an abundant bringer of life to others. Not just enough life for us, but enough life to flow out to others. For what 
the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful nature god did through sending jesus in the way of the flesh the focus is on what we do can i do enough have i done enough have i done something wrong have i done something right we end up with these ideas as the ancient egyptians used to believe where you put a scale out there and you put your good deeds on one side and your bad deeds on the other and how do they balance out and that determines what happens that's the focus on what we do and it's the way of the flesh and paul has laid out in extensive detail over chapter after chapter that that is never going to weigh out in our favor but the way of the spirit focuses on what christ has done already there's a humility that comes from saying that nothing that we can do in our whole lives and some of us have more ahead of it than others and if there's I, I don't know I can't see on here if the history makers are still in here but you know you have a, an entire life ahead of you and yet nothing you will do in that entire life will exceed what Christ has already done and there's a right humility in that and it's true of every human being think of the greatest human being by whatever measure you want and what they have achieved is nothing compared to what Christ has done already the evangelist J. John um, is known for his sound bites. If you've heard him speak, some of them are very corny and very cheesy, but somehow God just works through them. And there was a survey done. Uh, he was trying to sharpen up his rhetoric, if you like, and how he explained the gospel. And he, he did a survey of people who had come to faith through what he'd said and what were the phrases that had stuck with them. And absolute top of the list was you have to go via King's Cross. It's an appalling pun, but it's true. There is no escaping Christ's death on the cross as the central event of human history through which everything is changed. Through Christ's death and resurrection and ascension to heaven, we are sat on such a great store of treasure that no, no amount of spending of it can exhaust it and nothing we can do can really appreciably add to it. Christ's great accomplishment is already done and we live in the good of that we don't have to live in the good of what we do we live in the good of what christ has done the passage goes on and it says that the mind controlled by the flesh is hostile to god it cannot submit to god's law nor does it do so life in the flesh this gets down to our real identity now life in the flesh is bound to a doomed rebellion you can have different ideas about different rebellions that have taken place over the years. Ultimately, the, the rebellions tend to be assessed by who wins. And they then decide whether or not it was a good rebellion. But actually, whatever you think about rebellions, we as humanity are ever since, again, this alternative authority that we set ourselves up as to determine good and evil for ourselves. We have been in rebellion against God. And it is a doomed rebellion and the scriptures are very clear about where that rebellion is headed and our identity is as a rebel we are born into that rebellion and yet we have an option open to us if we are born again and choose to live by the spirit not only do we get free of being tied into that doomed rebellion but we are born again into a glorious kingdom we are bound to a kingdom where the king is good and right he's not only powerful but he's the source of everything that is good and right and beautiful. It's very hard for us to use any earthly models for that because we probably have issues with pretty much every person we see in authority to some degree or other. But God is not only powerful, but he is also good and strong and right and just. And we get to abandon this rebellion and live attached to that glorious kingdom. Instead of trying to act as though we belong, Instead, God says, no, you do belong. I've adopted you into my kingdom and I'm going to put my spirit in you. We are inhabited by the spirit of God. You imagine that picture at the end of the parable of the lost son, where he returns, having got to the absolute rock bottom. He returns and not only does his father run to greet him, but he puts a robe on him and a ring on his finger. And he says, you are my son with status. It's that and it's more. Not only do we have status as children of God and as sons of the king, but he puts his Holy Spirit in us. What greater privilege could there be? In the way of the flesh, we live for our own needs. I don't know if you get tangled up in what it means when Paul talks about the flesh 
And it's another one, a bit like the law that we talked about last week, where it can mean slightly different things depending on the context it's used in. But one of the simplest ways to think about it is that when we live by the flesh, we live for our own needs. And ultimately, living for our own needs is investing in something that is fatally flawed because our body will die and death will overwhelm life when we live for our own needs. That is the truth. Every single one of us, death will overwhelm life if we live for ourselves. But there's a new way, the way of the spirit. And if we live for God's desires, our body will die, but we will receive a resurrection body like Christ's. Life will overwhelm death. Death has been swallowed up in victory, as Paul says elsewhere. This is incredible. And it's worth just pausing for a second and saying that if you have been caught up in the ultimately Greek belief that Christianity is about an immortal soul, this is not the case. Our hope as Christians is not that we have an immortal soul. Our hope is that we will be resurrected and given a resurrection body which will last, one like Jesus's resurrection body. There's a writer called Bill Timaeus who wrote this, human bodies will in some mysterious, inexplicable way be part of what is resurrected, redeemed and honoured with eternal life. So even now those bodies are sacred. Our hope is not that we were already immortal in some spiritual sense and one day we'll get, get rid of this and, and we'll go being floaty spirits that live forever. No. God will resurrect us from death and we will live forever with him. Romans 8 goes on to talk about our relationship with fear. You see, while we live in the flesh, under the law, we're slaves. Slaves to sin. And slaves have no good permanent status. Their only permanent status is slavery. They have every reason to fear their master, and, and sin is a cruel master. Day by day, it reduces what it actually gives you and increases its demands of you in a spiral down towards death. There's a way of the spirit, Paul says, which is different. We are adopted children. We are sons and daughters. And the passage says God doesn't just tell us once and then leave us to remember it, but he gives us the Holy Spirit to testify with our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. And this is a critical part of this passage. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. What does that mean? Well, testifying is active. You can't testify passively. You don't show up in a courtroom and, and stand there as a witness and, and just you being there is, is counting for something. You have to say words, you have to do things to testify. And the Spirit is active in his testimony that we are children of God. I wonder what your story is of the Holy Spirit testifying that you are a child of God. If it's helpful to give some examples, I'll give you some of, of my story. The Holy Spirit has stilled anxiety and turmoil when situations overwhelm me. There was a time when I was teaching just part time a day a week and I got into a huge mess over coursework and I was overwhelmed. There were kids whose grades depended on me sorting it out and I felt totally inadequate. I was trying to do another job four days a week and I just remember going through two or three weeks of total stress and close to breakdown at times. And I knew God's sovereignty over all of it. Friends helped me find strength in God and I, there was a a sense of almost as though I was at the bottom of the sea with the weight of the sea pressing down on me. It was like God's sovereignty pressing down over me saying, I am in control. You are not, but I am in control and I will see you through this. I cannot tell you the peace that brought in those situations. That was the spirit testifying that I was a child of God. He's spoken to discipline me out of bad habits. I've shared some of those with this congregation already, but every good father disciplines his children. And sometimes the spirit has said to me, do not do that. Or you did that and you should not have done it. You need to repent. You need to change your ways. That's the spirit actively testifying that I'm a child of God. At times when my head has not been in a good place to hear him, he sent messages via other people. Somebody has said to me, I really believe that God is saying this to you. And I've weighed it up with God. And, and it's yes. 
He is saying that to me. It's spoken to a situation I'm in. The spirit testifying that I am a child of God and that he will get a message through to me, even if I have my fingers stuck in my ears. In worship, he's brought me to laughter and to tears because I've known him so close. I'm not just talking about good music. I've been in the situation where music has made me emotional, but I'm talking about far more than that, that shared experience that you have when someone is close to you in a situation that is intimate and it brings you to laughter or to tears. I've known that because the spirit has testified with my spirit that I am a child of God. What does this mean for you? What's your story? How has the spirit testified with your spirit that you are a child of God? If that's not an active part of your life, I want to encourage you, it can be. We're intended to be resilient children who are not doubting our adoption day by day, but living in the confidence that is given by the Holy Spirit testifying with our spirit that we are children of God. But there is a caveat here. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, do not quench the spirit of God. And that introduces a, a truth that is absolutely incredible, that the Holy Spirit, despite being God himself, can be quenched in us. We can quench the spirit if we close our ears to what he wants to say to us. We can quench the spirit if we refuse to respond to his discipline. We can quench the spirit if we don't make space in our lives for him to speak. We can quench the spirit if we don't regularly renew our mind with the word of God. We can quench the spirit if we don't go to him in prayer. The Holy Spirit testifying to God's parenthood will not only bring us things that are comfortable. Parents are very good, mostly at least, at encouraging us out of our comfort zones, taking us to things and places that we would not normally go, stretching us beyond our own idea of our capacity, having vision for us beyond where we are. And the Holy Spirit is no different in this. In fact, he is different in as much as he is perfect and not held back by his own fear or his own past experiences as human parents so often are. So I want to say to you that if the Holy Spirit has not challenged you, then maybe we need to be listening a little bit more. If the Holy Spirit has not ever taken you to a place that is uncomfortable in what he's said, then maybe there is greater listening that we need to do. Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. Lastly then, and there's more in this passage we could draw out, but I want to end on this part. Life under the law, life in the flesh has no future. We talked about how it's on a trajectory downwards towards death, but the future that Paul holds out for those who live by the spirit goes beyond belief. And we, we literally cannot get our heads around it. We can try and we can respond in faith, but we will not because no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has ever conceived the glorious things that God has prepared for those who trust in him. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Just let that sink in for a second. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Everything good that God owns and knows and has access to and enjoys, he will share with us forever. Everything. Absolutely everything. He is not withholding anything from us. Paul goes on to say later, and I'm stealing a bit from next week's passage, but he says if he didn't even withhold his own son, why would he withhold anything else from us? And so we have a life ahead of us, and this was how Virginia ended her reading. Christ endured the cross for the joy set before him. And we get that same life ahead of us, a life in which we do suffer, just as Christ suffered, although for most of us significantly less. But we also have a joy set before us. We have eternity with God. We have everything that's laid out in Revelation 21 and 22, a river of life flowing through the middle of our city. 
God living with his people, the tree of life available to all. No need for the sun or the moon because God's light is all around. No need for a temple because God is that close. All of that ahead of us and more. I cannot even begin to imagine what it's like, but all of that is ahead of us. And that changes our perspective on life, doesn't it? If all of that is ahead of us, we have no cause to worry. We have no cause to fear. And so I want to lead us to respond now in prayer. I'm just going to explain how I want to lead us here, because as you hear this, some of these bits will apply more to you than others. And so I want to explain where I'm going and you can choose which bits you want to amen to. But the first thing is this, with this way of the spirit laid out and the Holy Spirit testifying actively that we are children of God, have we quenched the spirit individually, having a set idea of how we do faith or perhaps corporately when we meet? Do we make space for the spirit? So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to lead us in praying a prayer of repentance, not a heavy one, because God desires to lead us out of things, but a prayer of repentance in which we say that we're sorry for having quenched the spirit. And then the second part is to ask God to fill us afresh. And there's a, a prayer in Ephesians 3 that I'm going to lead us through there. So let's close our eyes. Or however else you find it easiest to focus. And let's pray. God, the joy that you have set before us, both now in how we get to live without fear and condemnation and as children of God, and also in the future when we will be with you, with nothing dividing forever, with no pain and no suffering, no sickness and no death. God, that is so incredible and we are so grateful. Holy Spirit, if there are times that individually or corporately we have quenched you by being unresponsive, by being too busy, by not making space, by hearing of what you're doing elsewhere and saying, but that won't happen here, or maybe it isn't even real. God, we repent. And we pray that you would forgive us and help us to live differently to live a life in which we are overflowing with the spirit and not quenching the spirit and in that vein god we pray for a fresh filling of your spirit now holy spirit would you testify with our spirit that we are children of god would you cause us to overflow with life, not just for ourselves, but for others? For this reason, Paul writes, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And we take that prayer and we make it our own this morning, God. Would you fill us with the power of your spirit to know the depths of your love that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith and that we may live in step with the spirit. Amen. Amen.